Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah Hilladi Anzala Ala Abdi Hil Kitaba Walam Yajalla Hu Ewaja Walhamdulillah Lam Yelid Walam Yulad Walam Yakulla Hu Kufu and Ahad Walhamdulillah Nahmadu Hu Wanestainu Hu Wanestal Firu Wanarudu Billahi Min Shururi and Fusina Wamin Sayi Ati Armalina May Yahdi Hilahu Fala Mudilla ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه عباد الله قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد The scholars in Islam the علماء they describe a certain disease in the hearts of mankind and this isn't a disease that you'll see outwardly. You may see it, but you might not see it. But the disease that the scholars are talking about are within the heart. And they say that's, that, that this disease is a man's consideration of himself as worth more than any other person. That he looks at himself or herself with the eye of self-glorification and he looks at other people with the eye of contempt. And the scholars, they actually describe this disease in the hearts of mankind as a chronic disease. And if you look up in the dictionary what the word chronic means, the one synonym that you'll see along with the word chronic is the word reoccurring. Which means that this disease that the scholars are describing, it's not something that happens once. It's a reoccurring struggle that people deal with day in and day out. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says that the Prophet ﷺ said that any person who has an Adam's weight, an Adam's weight worth of this disease in their heart, they will not enter the ultimate bliss of paradise. And so the Prophet used the word, the Adam's worth, that Adam's weight worth, which is the smallest particle even scientifically that you can find. And the Prophet ﷺ says, if you have even this much of this disease in your heart, then you should be worried for the hereafter. You should be worried for your final destination, whether it's Jannah or the other one. So whenever we deal with an issue like this, we look back into the life of the one man, the one man that had everything thrown at him. If we look into the life of the Prophet Wasallam, we realize that this man had every single trial and tribulation thrown in his direction. And in English term, you can say he had the kitchen sink thrown at him, which basically means that every possible thing that could have tried him and tested him were given to him. And so, when we talk about these topics during Jummah Khutbahs, we look back in his life and we say, how did we match up to him? When we say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are we just saying it because everyone else says it? Or are we saying it truly because we appreciate the sacrifice that this man made in his lifetime for people that he didn't even know yet? There are narrations that say that the Prophet ﷺ used to spend his nights crying to the point his beard was drenched in his own tears. Why? 
why was his beard drenched in his tears? Because he was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive his ummah that's going to come after him. So we ask ourselves this question. Do we spend some time? Do we spend some time with Allah one on one? And do we shed a few tears? Forget about people that will come after us. Do we even shed tears for our own family members? Do we shed tears for our friends? Do we shed tears for the community? Do we shed tears for our brothers and sisters overseas who are suffering? Do we shed tears for our brothers and sisters in this country that are suffering? This is the example that our dear, dear beloved Prophet wasallam he left us. And so the topic that we're discussing today, the hadith that I, that I, just, I just spoke about, that was narrated by Ibn Mas'ud, you see, it's very interesting that when people, when human beings, we can truly see how weak human beings really are, is that when we're given any sort of leadership or power, we think that it gives us the right to treat people any which way we want to. This is why the companions of the Prophet, they used to actually stay away from positions as much as possible. They didn't want positions of power. They wanted to be left alone, let other people have it, because with power comes great responsibility. And so, when we are in positions of power and positions of leadership, we open the doors possibly of the disease of kibr. We open the door of this possible disease of arrogance, of thinking that we, for some reason in our minds, think that we have the right to think that we're better than other people. That we in our minds think that we should be able to give ourselves certain treatment that others don't deserve. And the reference that I will discuss in today's khutbah is from Surah Al-Imran. In Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks for 60 ayat. He discusses in 60 or more ayat about the battle of Uhud. And he talks about three subjects about this, this story. First, he talks about how different the battle of Uhud was from the battle of Badr. The second thing he does is that he tells the story of the battle of Uhud. And the third thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about in this surah, in Surah Al-Imran, is a council that took place after the battle of Uhud was over. Because we know, subhanAllah, the first thing that Allah mentions, how different the battle of Uhud was between the, uh, from the battle of Badr, was that the battle of Badr, the Muslims went into the battle of Badr very, very scared. They went into the battle of Badr very, very apprehensive. They were not sure what was going to happen because they were vastly outnumbered. And they go into the battle of Badr praying to Allah, hoping that Allah gives them some sort of success when with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they came out victorious. So think about how the battle of Badr started. It started with very a, a, a bit of apprehension. And it ended with ultimate gratefulness and joy that they were able to overcome this unbeatable foe. And then the battle of Uhud took place. Complete opposite. The battle of Uhud came along and the Muslims were very, very confident in themselves. That if Allah helped us defeat an army that was way bigger than us, we only had 300 people, how could we not win this one with the help of Allah? And we all know that the outcome of the battle of Uhud was completely different. It was a flip opposite of the battle of Badr. And when the Prophet wasallam. You see, the Prophet ﷺ was such an amazing human being that he was not just a master of, uh, of, of being a prophet, he was a master of a lot of different things. He knew, he had a lot of wisdom, he had a lot of hikmah in his brain. And he told his, his army and he said, no matter what happens, stay on top of this mountain, stay on top of this hill. Even if you see us being killed, stay on top of this hill, don't move. This position is extremely important. And after the battle ensued, the Prophet ﷺ and his army, they were winning this battle against the oppressors. They were winning. 
and the army that was on top of the mountain, the ranks that were on top of the mountain, the archers that were on top of the mountain, they saw this from a distance and they said, what would it hurt? You know, the Prophet ﷺ told us not to come down if they were losing. But subhanAllah, like, what if we're winning? We're winning right now. And they saw a lot of these wealth and a lot of this, a lot of this, a lot of this bounties and, 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 and benefits on the battlefield. And they were drawn to it. You know, the normal translation of this story goes that the companions of the Prophet disobeyed the Prophet's orders. This isn't so true. It wasn't a blatant disobedience of the Prophet's orders. It was a misunderstanding. Because the Prophet said, don't come down. Even if we're being killed, don't come down. But they said, the, but now the Prophet and the army are winning. So why can't we go down? So they leave their post on top of the mountain and they go down. And because of this, we know that Khalid ibn Walid, before he became Muslim, Khalid ibn Walid was an amazing, amazing strategist. So Khalid ibn Walid, he saw this. He saw the Muslims come down from the army. They left their post. And so Khalid ibn Walid, he said, let's go around this mountain and we'll attack from behind. So all of a sudden, a situation in which it was benefiting the Muslims turned completely the opposite. Khalid ibn Walid, he brought his army from behind and he attacked from behind and the entire story, the entire narrative changed just with that one decision. And because of this, the Muslims lost the battle of Uhud as we all know. And not only that, the Prophet wasallam, he was injured during this battle. The narrations say that the Prophet when he was struck during this battle, he was wearing a helmet and the helmet, he was struck so hard that his helmet that was covering his cheeks, it caved in and it cut his face. And there was a rumor that went around during this battle that the Prophet ﷺ had passed away. And Umar radiallahu an, who was so strong at heart, he was such a tough human being. Umar radiallahu an, when he heard this, he heard this rumor that the Prophet may have passed away, he dropped his sword. He dropped his sword and he said, what's the point? He dropped his sword and he said, if the Prophet ﷺ had passed away, what's the point of doing this? And not only that, we know the Prophet ﷺ, alhamdulillah did not pass away in that battle, but we know who did. And it was a very near and dear person to the Prophet's heart, which was Hamza, which was the Prophet's uncle, and one of his closest friends. And he was killed in this battle. And think about the emotions running through the Prophet's mind right now. Think about the emotions running through the heart of the Prophet He was very upset. It was a difficult thing to digest for him. That a battle that they were winning, they all of a sudden they lost. And not only that, one of his most beloved family members had passed away. And because of this, the Prophet he, after this battle was over, he called a meeting with the companions of that battle. He called a meeting between all of them. And if you imagine this, imagine in our normal work lives, what would happen? What would happen if we messed up at work? What would happen if we messed up, if we're, if we're a salesperson and we lost a huge sale? And your boss calls you into a meeting and he wants to discuss with you what went wrong. What would our emotions be? We'd be scared. You might get fired. You go into this council, into this meeting, fearful about what might happen. And think about this, we're just talking about money in this case. We're talking about if you're, if you're in trouble with your work or job, you're in trouble with money. Think about the situation that the Prophet had to deal with. He had lost family. He lost companions. There were lives that were lost during that day. If everybody could scoot forward a little bit, inshallah, it would be greatly beneficial. And so the Prophet calls this meeting, this council, and this is the verse of this surah that I want to discuss. Because when the Prophet ﷺ called this meeting, 
there was a verse that was revealed about this meeting. It was very incredible. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says about this council, He says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ And Allah says about the Prophet sallallahu He says, only by the mercy of Allah were you able to be merciful with them. Think about a boss that has all the right to be angry with you. But Allah is saying here, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ by the mercy of Allah. And Allah doesn't, and you know what's very interesting is that in normal Quranic Arabic, that if you are describing the mercy of Allah, you usually say Rahmatullah. You don't say Rahmatim min Allah, but Allah uses the phrase Rahmatim min Allah, which specifies how beautiful this account of mercy was. Which specifies the beauty of the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Because the grace and mercy of Allah, only by the grace and mercy of Allah were you able to be lenient with them. لِنْتَ لَهُمْ So the Prophet, this is the character the Prophet ﷺ was. He was in a position of leadership. Not only religiously, not only politically, even in the military, he was in a form of leadership. And these people misunderstood his command, and because of this misunderstanding, this great tragedy happened. But you know, subhanAllah, something very interesting is that it's easy to be a good person when everything is going right. It's easy to be fair to everybody when everything's going according to plan. But what's difficult? It's difficult to keep your manners and your etiquettes when things aren't going according to plan. The true test that Allah gives us is how do you answer when things are not going well in your life. And the word linta actually is a, it's synonymous for being gentle. It's synonymous for being gentle. And not only that, there is a word in, in, in Arabic called talayyana which means that not only did the Prophet ﷺ, not only was he gentle with them, the word talayyana actually means that he was complimenting them. So how in the world is the Prophet complimenting people that disobeyed him? Talayyana means that when you enter a room, you compliment that person, right? If your mother or father walks in a room, is mashallah, you look very good today, mashallah, right? Or you tell your mother, alhamdulillah, your, your, your dinner was amazing last night. This is talayyana, this is complimenting people, right when they enter a room. So the Prophet ﷺ, he complimented his companions. And not only that, the tafsir, the scholars of tafsir, they say that the Prophet not only was gentle with them, not only complimented them, but he asked them what could have been done differently to avoid this. Imagine, again, I'll, I'll draw the analogy of work again, because it's so relevant to everybody. Imagine if we messed up a little bit at work, at our job. Would our bosses ask us, what do you think we should have done? What do you think, what, what's your opinion? What's your opinion on the next time this happens? Our bosses say, no, you've done, you've done enough. You've done enough. But the Prophet said, what do you think we could have done differently? He's asking them for advice. Look at the characteristic of this man, subhanAllah is that not only was he gentle with them, he complimented them, and on top of that, he asked them about their opinion. This is the sign of a true leader. This is the sign of a man who had la ilaha illallah in his heart. This was the man that didn't use his position as a prophet of Allah to abuse other people. This was a man who used his position as the prophet of Allah to show mercy to everyone else and to live as an example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا So, subhanAllah, we understand. And in the following, in the following 
verse and the following statements, Allah says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ That, if you had been rude in speech with them or harsh in your heart, غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ If you were harsh in your heart with them, they may have turned away from you. Look at the wisdom Allah gives us. That if you're harsh in your words, and not only that, but if you're harsh with your heart, they may have turned away from you. So the Prophet went the opposite direction. He avoided being harsh in speech and harsh with his heart, and he wanted to be lenient in speech and lenient with his heart. So brothers and sisters, we understand sometimes in life that people will test us. There's undoubtedly, this is the truth, that people will test us. But it's our job during these times where we're tested to show what the true characteristic of a Muslim really is. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us more of the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of all of our sins and reward us inshallah for our patience. Amin ya rabbil alameen subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant wa astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. If we could have the brothers scoot forward a little bit, I know we have a very, very packed masala today, inshallah. So if we have any space, just uh, scoot forward, inshallah. So, since we told an amazing account in the life of the Prophet about this amazing attribute that he had of mercy in the face of arrogance, how do we, as regular people, how do we counter this disease? And the scholars, they say, you know, just like diagnosing a disease as a doctor, I'm sure we have a lot of doctors in the house is that whenever you diagnose a disease, you look first for the what? You look first for the symptom, right? If you have the flu, if you have a sickness, the first thing you do, the doctor asks you, what do you have that may make you think that you have this illness? So they ask for your symptoms. So what are some of the symptoms of this disease of arrogance? One of the symptoms that these scholars say is being constantly critical of other people. One of the symptoms of arrogance is being constantly critical of other people. Thinking that if we criticize people all the time, that there'll be some benefit to come out of it. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't always critical. He gave criticism when it was needed, but the Prophet never always used to criticize everyone. He used to always see the best of humanity, even in the wrong. Even in times like this narration that we had in Surah Al-Imran, the Prophet always saw the half glass full. The glass half full was the way he used to look at things. And number two, the scholars they say is a symptom of arrogance is always feeling the need to voice our opinions on everything. And subhanAllah brothers and sisters, how apparent is this today? Is voicing our opinions on every single thing that we can find. And it's so easy to do so with social media and the internet nowadays. Is that anybody and everybody can voice their opinions on everything. The scholars, they say that if you feel the need to always speak and say something from your own accord, if you always need to feel, if you feel the need to speak and voice your opinion, hold yourself back. The Prophet wasallam was amazing when he was known for being very silent. He only spoke when he was needed. He only spoke when it was needed. And you know an amazing, amazing lesson to take away from this is that when we speak all the time, our words are not valued. But look at the Prophet when he spoke and a lot of his hadith that he had, a lot of his sayings and a lot of his actions he had were very, very small. But look how much value it had. Look how much value every single word that the Prophet ﷺ said it had. And one of the cures for this disease of arrogance, one of the cures to actually remedy this disease is to always remember our own weaknesses. Yes, people will have their faults, people will have their mistakes, but always remember that we too have our own mistakes. Is that no matter how many faults people have, it's not our job to always look at other people's faults. Our job first is to look within. And inshallah, we'll end with this short, short story inshallah today. It's a very incredible story that one of my teachers, he taught me. He told this story 
of a scholar of, the, of language. He was a very, very smart linguist. And he wrote many books about grammar and language. And he undertook a journey one time. And a river had to be crossed on his journey. So as was custom, the scholar, he hired a boat that was waiting and a ferryman that was controlling that boat. So he hired this person that was controlling this boat to take him across the river. And so once the scholar, he got on the boat during this journey, he asked the person, the boatman, he asked the ferryman and he said, and he said it in a very proud way. He said, if he knew anything about grammar and language, what do you know about language and grammar? And the ferryman, he said, I, don't, I know nothing of it. So I have, no, I have no knowledge of it. And the scholar, he says, Alas, you have wasted half of your life. You've wasted half of your life not knowing grammar and language. And all of a sudden, the story turns, and there's a strong storm that hits the water. There's a strong storm that hits the water, and suddenly the, bo the, the boat was going through an extreme turbulence. And then the ferryman turns to the scholar and he says, do you know how to swim? And the scholar, he says, no, I don't know how to swim. And the ferryman says, well, this boat is about to sink, so it seems like you wasted your entire life. SubhanAllah. So sometimes the moral of the story, brothers and sisters, is that sometimes we think that we know a lot of things. We think that we sometimes we know everything and sometimes we value our knowledge more than other people's but we always remember at the end of the day that everyone is looked at as the same under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ourselves have no right to think of other people less than we are. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this disease of arrogance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this disease of kibr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to make us humble. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in the service of other people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always see us as equals as everyone else. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of all of our sins and our mistakes and our shortcomings. And we ask Allah to lift the veil of oppression from all these countries around the world and also here in our own country here. Amin Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa aqina adha banna. اللهم إنك أفوا كريم تحب الأفوا فاف عنا اللهم إنك أفوا كريم تحب الأفوا فاف عنا اللهم إنك أفوا كريم تحب الأفوا فاف عنا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله إن الله يعمل بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أقيم الصلاة